Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. So happy to have you here. We have an incredible episode with the rabbi and Rebbitzin from Rustov. They're not originally from there. They made quite the moves in life to get there. And they are serving such a large Jewish community over there in Russia. We hear so many stories. A nice, good, long episode. So buckle up. It's a great episode. And of course, part of the whole family, the Eshkin family and the Rustov family, the Danziger family, is Tavito, and they're part of my family too. Tavito is the number one place for all Jewish content. No more YouTube, no more Netflix, no more of that stuff. Tavito is all you need. It's all you need, and you can get it so many different places besides for Tavito.com. Get it on Roku, get it on Apple TV, Amazon TV, plus other places. Tavito is for you and your family. You're going to love the content on there. There's so much leading up to Purim, whether it's McGillis Lester, The Secret Room, shows that your kids will really enjoy and that you'll feel good about and you'll feel comfortable with them watching it. So right now, head to Tavito.com. That is T-O-V-E-E-D-O.com. Tavito.com. Get 10% off your subscription right now with promo code MM10. That is MM10. You will love it. I love it. My kids love it. Tavito.com. Something that is really cool about Tavito is they're putting new content in every week. Okay, so... You go on there and you see stuff and you're like, this is good. This is good. Okay. Like, this is what we're signing up for. No, 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 no. It gets better. That's what Tavito does. They create brand new content, 3D stuff, 2D stuff, all for you. Every week, new content up at Tavito.com. Hey guys, so Perm is coming up and uh, time to give tzedakah, right? It's time to give tzedakah all year. But do you know how much meister you have? Do you know how much tzedakah you'd be giving? Do you know what you can afford to be spending on Shalach Manas? Do you know if that Perm party you're about to make is highly irresponsible. Not that any simcha is irresponsible, but you know what I mean. Like, you don't want to put your family in debt. You need to get with Moshe Alpert at Alpert and Associates at Saremian, okay? Because when it comes to giving tzedakah, you should know exactly how much meister you have. I personally, I set up a meister account with Moshe Alpert. Very simple. I have an account. Every single month, there's meister in there, hopefully. And I'm giving my meister through there. And you could have the same. It's super simple. It's the responsible thing to do. And in terms of your financial planning, you, you don't want to get into a position where you're like, whoa, what did I do? I couldn't afford that. I can't afford that car. I can't afford this. I can't afford that. Like, you don't need to live playing catch up. That, that's why you need to call Moshe Alper today. 718-644-1594. Yes, I have that phone seared into my memory. It's 718-644-1594. Or email at alpertmoshe at gmail.com. Take care of really anything you need when it comes to insurance, finances, MICER, uh, 401ks, retirement funds, anything. It's worth giving them a call. And by the way, I was by the Project Inspire convention last week. I want to give a big shout out to some of our junior listeners, our real junior listeners, our youngsters, the Gutwine family, Ezra Jaffe, Shlomo Clarer. Thank you so much for listening to the pod. Appreciate your support and stay in school and learn. This is just a special edition episode because I am without my partner, my partner in crime, Momo, who was traveling the world. I think he was in Israel when we recorded this. But um, here is some content from me and the rabbi and Rebetzin from Rostov. You are listening to the Meaningful People podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Thank you so much for coming all the way from Rostov. Rostov, Russia. Stopped in Houston. Now you're here in New York. But we stopped just on the way. This was the This was the, the goal. Wow. Yeah. I'm so sorry for making you travel so much. 33 hours. Is that is that the flight? 33 it is. hours? It's a 33-hour yeah, flight, flight from Russia? No, no. no it's it, it, How is it? So it's six hours to Minvadi, um, which is our closest airport now that they closed it's a six our six-hour what? Flight? Six-hour drive. From Rostov to? To Minvadi. Okay. Um, what translates mineral water. Yeah. Interesting. That's the name of the city. That's the name of the city. <laughs> yeah. Um, we used to have an airport. It was a really, really nice airport, a new one. Um, and then they closed it because of the war. So now they use it just for military um, Serious. operations. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you guys are really feeling the war? Oh, yeah, for sure. We're right by the border. We're by Donbass. Donbass is our backyard. Right. So uh, wow. if anyone in Russia feels it, it's us. Crazy. So you guys take me back to, to Olive. Uh, where were you living? I guess you guys get married, and how'd you end up in in Rostov? Give me the give me the scoop. Okay, Kayla. <laughs> um, okay, so 
Go we could start it. from the very beginning when yeah. we were dating. Um, no, 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 the very beginning is when we were both in Ukraine in the yeah. same camp, the okay. same year. Yes. But we didn't but know each other. We didn't. Oh, we really that, didn't. <laughs> that, that, you know, when you tell people that we were in the same camp at the same year, people are like suspicious. Wait, you had a little um, freelance dating. No, but it was two different months, right? Yeah. That was the, uh, God had his way of having us. I was in a camp for the boys. She was in a camp for the girls. In Crimea. Right. Amazing summer. And what, wait, what did your brother say? He came back from came camp. back. Oh, this is when I was 16. He came back and he said, I have a girl for Kayla. A guy, sorry, a guy for Kayla. And you're 16. I was 16. And my parents were like, oh, let's hear about it. And he told them about Chaim. Your parents and entertained it like when you were just 16? They Like they always entertained new okay. ideas. <laughs> Her mother's um, a Shadchan, so yeah. she never so says she was no. Like, Tell me, there's a guy's name, um, and so my brother would like show me videos of him. Actually, and I was I like, I can't say no, I was no, approving no, no, no. of the videos you showed her. <laughs> not uh, at all. Um, and I was like, no, no, I'm not going to marry this type of guy. <laughs> why? What was it? Because he was like wearing like crazy costumes and like being but, I mean, really out there. You were in Ukraine as as a way to we were, bring we were the making kids of giving them joy, happiness, bring them simcha. So. Um, but but it was funny because I was with her brother. He didn't mention anything about having a sister or anything. He was just like really friendly. I mean, Ellie. Yeah. It's Ellie, right? Oh, yeah, so her was... brother that you oh, met. Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so, he's, um, so he was the Shadchan. He, uh, he came back. And what happened? And it was put on hold for a couple of years. Right. Um, well, she was 16. Right, she yeah, was 16, was 16. Right. <laughs> So, um, and then what happened? And then, then um, I guess when I started dating, I was already 21. And... Um, my mother went back to Ellie and said, let's hear about this guy that you, you were suggesting. And um, the name came up again. We started doing research. And then Chaim was the first guy that I ever dated. And wow. <laughs> and, there he, and here you are. Right. And we uh, sealed the deal. And we got married in Pittsburgh. We lived Wait, in well, we Pittsburgh. You're from about, Pittsburgh? Yeah, I'm from Pittsburgh. Okay. Yeah. Go steal But the first three dates, <laughs> we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't even talk about the fact that Chaim wanted to live in like Russia or Ukraine. And Ellie, my brother, didn't even mention that to me either. I had no idea. I was totally, like, blinded by that. And then on our third date, Chaim kind of dropped the bomb on me. And he was like, yeah, we're going to be living in Russia. And I was like, not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can live in Russia, but that's not for me. This is a good, like, and, dating, and, dating and, advice column right here. Absolutely. <laughs> so how do you take that? I said, okay, bye. I'm going to go to the next shidduch now. Really? Yeah. You no, were? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, at that point, at that point, I felt we had a good chemistry. And then we... we enjoyed each other's company. We had a lot of similar values. Um, and, and I said, what did, what did I say? I said, you I, said, let's put it on hold for oh, a little bit. Oh, right. With the Russia stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like, let's continue and see how this goes. And then, you know, like once we get engaged or if it gets to engagement, then we'll like bring up the subject again. I think with dating, that's a very important actually advice that I, uh, you know, we just learned on our own that sometimes you see a, a problem and it could it could just blind you and doesn't let you go further. Sometimes you say, "Wait a minute, why am I getting caught up in a problem that, first of all, it might not even be my problem? Let me first see if 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 our if our you know relationship is going anywhere." Right. Once you see it go somewhere, good. Then you could come back to the problem. Let's say sometimes it's family. You have you know some some type of issue with something in the family, or you have some of someone's past, and you're thinking, "Wait, it's too too bothersome." But but we said, "Hey, let's put this this baggage on the side." Well, you had to be willing. To do that, so why was I willing? I, again, no, you had to be right. Like, but I could always say, "Hey, I, I feel that the dating will continue. If it goes so well, she'll win me over, and then meaning will, you'll either want to not go to Russia, right. or she'll want to go to Russia. Exactly. Yeah, one of us is going to have yeah. to give in if we're meant to be together. Love, love conquers all. Absolutely, and totally. absolutely. And, and I, you know what? I, by the time we got engaged, I was like, "Okay." to russia and Chaim was like no no no, i'll stay in america <laughs> oh that's so that's really beautiful yeah okay so yeah. you guys got you got engaged and where was the i guess the place to start um oh, wait that's easy all chabad people start in crown heights where okay. else yeah so yeah. the uh, first year we knew would be crown heights so we already is that knew. is that something across the board shana Rishana, all Pretty chabad much. yeah yeah, yeah. everyone crown heights yeah. everyone starts year out is there this? this is 2005 yeah um, okay Okay, 2005. I know we look a lot older. Not no, me, you look younger. I, yeah, yeah. My wife looks younger. Math. By the way, it's funny. Like when we go on a taxi in Russia, several times the taxi drivers are like, um, uh, where she calls my wife my daughter. <laughs> right? That happens? No? That's happened. It happens yeah. several times. You, pay, you don't pay them to do that. It, 
So no. <laughs> it, it's a mix between her looking young and me. You know, we get white white beard in Russia comes early for some reason. Yeah. So um, so we lived a year in Crown Heights and yeah. it was nice, right? Our first son was born there, Mendel. Yeah, and then we were looking on sh for shulchas. So um, we looked at all these different opportunities. Um, and at that point, I think Russia wasn't really on the cards because we'd gotten used to like, or you had gotten used to like living the American life and being dream, comfortable. You're say dream? <laughs> American dream. <laughs> Um, and then we started really only looking in America. I, I, I felt that Kayla wasn't so much, you know, she was willing to go because I was passionate about it, but I felt like we have to go somewhere that we'll both handle and we both equally want to go there. Because Shlachas is a, is a lifelong commitment. And to go somewhere that you're very reluctant or you're unsure or something else, I think so. So we looked into options and... Um, and so we got, I think, like a really good offer for Lubavitch. This was like an amazing offer. Um, Pasadena, California. Sounds nice. Right? <laughs> Especially yeah. coming from like snowy, cold New York to California. Pittsburgh, Thompson, I'm right? from Toronto. <laughs> Suddenly you're being offered to go to California. It's any person's dream. And Pasadena is a beautiful city right outside well, what's LA. That, what's that process like when you got an offer? Like, is there like, oh, we'll pass only for another offer? Or is it you need to take the offer? If you want to be a shliach, do you, you have to just take that offer that comes to so, you? So it's interesting. Way, way back in the day when the Rebbe would send himself shlochem, the Rebbe would, you know, tell someone where he is needed. And that was, you know, the Rebbe telling you and you you, you pretty much want to do what the Rebbe is. He needs I think you there. sometimes people would send in like a letter to the Rebbe with like three different offers and then the Rebbe would circle one. Where they that should go. Happen, yeah. 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 So that's later on already. That's okay. later on. Um, for us nowadays, it works really that there's no such system that you must go somewhere. Really? We know that we're brought up for, in, in the Chabad world. The uh, goal of any young Lubavitcher is to go on Shalachas, to become an emissary. That's the biggest privilege. It's the biggest merit. And that's what we, you know, in some secular, not just secular, for other people, it's maybe to become a lawyer, to become a doctor. In our circle, the biggest you know, like joy. Like nachas that parents would have yeah. is if their child is on shlucha. Were your parents shlucham? No. Yours? So both no. of our parents no. are no. balei tshuva. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. from all sides. Right. Um, so we... we, we were, they, were they uh, from made from Shluchen. by Chabad? Yes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Right. So you have here from Toronto, from Ottawa, from uh, My Cleveland. My parents were in Cleveland, right. Um, that the, the Rebbe's emissaries brought our families uh, back to Yiddishkeit at Amazing. some point. And, and, and we just felt we were brought up we were brought up uh, in a Lubavitch household and that was our passion. That's the values we grew on was to be able to go and to go to a place that we're needed to help the Jews there somehow or another. Not that we're uh, above them, that we could help them or something, but just to be a, a source of, 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 of uh, you know, support and uh, to do what we were taught to help other people around us. So we got this offer to go. So you're saying, how, how do we get offers? So the way it works nowadays is, there's like, there could be like, um, there's a lot of young couples looking for places to go. Uh, you could sign up with, let's say an office that the liaison, or when we were, there was like an office that was helping to coordinate a kind of a shadchan, but not for marriage, for shluchas opportunities. There's like an agent? Of, yeah, 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 totally. That's amazing. And um, we'll have an interview with him and explain like what our, you know. But what, what, what what I, I feel like this part, so many people don't know. Yeah, yeah. Especially oh, really? in my circles, like no one thinks like, well, how'd this guy end up in in Mauritius or how do you end up in like right. Rostov like right. how does that happen and, and each each potential shidduch has an agent that does their bidding for them so they have it's it's not really an agent when I was there there was a the shluchim office had someone working in the shluchim office that was helping to coordinate so if you had the head shliach the head emissary to a state or to a city that he was looking to bring down someone else for another part of town or another city in the state um, where would he look? He'd say, I'm looking. That's one of the avenues he would go through would be to tell this office, well, I'm looking for a new shliach, a new emissary to come out to one of these cities or a neighborhood. And we, and then they'd line up and see who's looking and see what, what's a fit. They'd interview. We even made see, our own profile. Like yeah, so you have, a shiluch, our, you have a shiluch profile. We had a, a shlichus profile. One. We did, yeah. Yeah, and thankfully the shlichus profile, the, the good thing is that we don't have to pay shadchanas geld. You know, when you marry, <laughs> you have to give the shadchan. Not that not, not, it's a bad thing. She's deserving. Yeah. But here, we didn't have to give any. So so, so different offers came up. So we were offered. What else? So we I, I, camp. We were offered some camp. Oh, to run that. a camp because yeah. I had experience with camp. I think that was also California. I spent a year when I was a student uh, on shlichus in Hong Kong. I spent a year in Italy, in Venice. I spent a year in South Africa. So I always liked these more remote places um, where I felt like 
you were more needed, you had more of an impact. Um, but when it came to looking, when, when, when California came up, it was a pretty decent offer that we didn't really have to think twice, right? Right. I mean, the Shliach also that we would be working for is was, like It was top phenomenal. Notch. Like his a name, really good guy. In Pasadena. Yeah. yeah. His name is Chaim Hanoka. His wife is Chani. Yeah. And when we met with him, just like, let, let's be honest, it's a Shliach, it's a Shliach. So yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to find someone that you have chemistry with, that you understand each other, that you won't step on each other's toes. And with him, he's just, they're just, just phenomenal people. Very, and very genuine, authentic people. We were very lucky to be there, actually. And just kind people, people that, I mean, we lived there for two years. Every Friday, they'd buy us challah. Like small things, just, they'd care for us. They'd go, because LA, the kosher store is in LA, a half hour away, 45 minutes away. They just kind of always thinking, always doing like just a small example, right? But it was just like from the first second we met him, we just felt like, wow. And he also has a good sense of humor, yeah. right? Yeah. And I also have a little bit of a, I enjoy. You have you a good know, sense of humor. I don't say about my, but we enjoy having a good time. So I felt it was a good shidduch. And after meeting him a few times, he invited us out to check it out, right? It was Hanukkah, I think. Yeah, even earlier. Yeah. I think it was Rosh Hashanah, okay. first time we met there. Okay. No, we but went, when the I went first time to we went to Pasadena, really? okay. yeah. I remember just landing in California and you just yeah. see like, oh, yeah. Good, yeah, yeah, I know. We actually landed at Burbank okay. and, and it was just great weather and beautiful palm trees and just like coming to this Chabad house and it was just like, everything was so amazing. It was like, we just went in and we loved it and um, love on first sight. <laughs> and what happened? Second we, time. <laughs> yes, yes. But not to replace the first one. Um, <laughs> what happened? So we were there, we settled down, we moved there, rented an apartment. I got involved with um, students in Caltech, which is the California Institute of Technology. These people are geniuses. And unfortunately, when I invite them for Shabbos, like I wasn't part of the conversation. They got into the <laughs> now, you remember? They would have these like riddles that like everybody had to solve. Right. And and we'd, we'd like, look at each other and be like, uh, uh, I have no idea what, what they're talking yeah, it about was, here. It was, you know, when you see campus, campus Shalachim, I have a very deep um, appreciation and love my, my for them. cousin is Yossi Gordon who oh wow so who he, run, who he run, he's, he's, he's head, head of the whole campus wow. so, so so that's something that is good friend of mine is Avi Weinstein oh wow is is Weinstein from Pittsburgh or no no different, different Weinstein no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay so so for me these these like it's a it's a serious undertaking a big sacrifice and and the other thing is that they you're, you're all day long with students and they're deep and they're so 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 it was, it was an interesting uh you know Experience. experience yeah yeah we enjoyed that what else did we do i was running their preschool which was really nice it was a very small preschool my son was able to be there it was really like ideal honestly it was very you didn't ideal. think you're like we're good in california yeah, we I love was totally Pasadena. good right i mean i remember like pushing my stroller and seeing the palm trees in the sun like and i was like what could be better you know like it was perfect <laughs> Living life. Yeah. yeah yeah the only problem was every night i'd fall asleep crying <laughs> What's that? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Because you want to be in Russia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what's, yeah. what happened really? What? So, okay, I'll You're tell hearing? you. Yeah. Okay, Give me the year. But yeah, just so make sure you hold it. So it was the year 2008, right? Yeah. Um, And slowly but surely, I saw that my husband was not the way I married him. Like, he was always like a very outgoing, very personable person. Um, And then as time went on, he just kind of like lost the light in his eyes. That, that like, that spark. Yeah. And I remember like I really tried like, you know, maybe I could do this or do that, but it wasn't me, you know, and I saw that there was something that he really, he just didn't enjoy life the way he used to. Well, props to you, first of all, for, for noticing, noticing that and, and setting out to do something about that. That's, uh, that is, I'm sure your husband uh, is very grateful Excuse for that. And absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, but at the same time, like I wanted my husband back, you know? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so that lasted, what, a few months? Probably. And then like we brought the, the conversation up a few times, like, are you happy here? Could you see yourself being here in the in five years from now and 10 years from now? And I think it was hard for you to imagine. What was the that. answer for you? If, you was, if, I, if he were to ask you, can you see yourself living here in five years from now? You're like, yeah. Yeah. And we really had that conversation. I was and, like, I, I could see myself. Yeah. And, and Rukhaim, like, I, I, you know, it was it was a hard decision because on the one hand, you know, if you're in a place that you're not, you're not happy or you're having difficult um, relationships with the other shluchim or the people, the rabbis that are about, it would be difficult, but everything was ideal. Meaning we, we, we had a good relationship. We had a good mission. We were doing well. Um, we felt very, you know, loved felt, by the community. Yes. We really connected to the community. Everything was, so to speak, going well. On paper. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, well. yeah. Yeah. it just the people, I love them. They loved us. We love them, right? Um, yeah. Everything was great, but it, I just felt that having spent 
maybe five summers and a full year in the former Soviet Union, it was Ukraine at the time uh, where I was, um, it, it just felt that, that, you know, I could be doing more. I felt like there we were really impacting the lives of people at a level that you were just saving their lives, saving both like materially, physically by helping them, people that were really, you know, underprivileged and needed support, material support. And on a spiritual level, if we didn't help, it's not like there was another uh, Chabad, Eshet Torah, right. young Israel. Just go up the it, it, right. California, the I imagine, is it, you know, it's almost like Florida. Like there's a yeah. lot of a every lot of two places. blocks. There's yeah. another literally, like, maybe not every two, every mile in every direction. There's another Chabad house, another synagogue, another temple, and so there's there's options. There there wasn't. So I just felt like you know, it, in business, if at the end of the year you see that you're not, you know, the the the, the balance sheet is not is not giving you what you're supposed to, you're going to change, switch things up because business is all about money. And Shlachas, I felt like, you know, what, what, what Shlachas is all about, impacting the lives of people and spreading goodness and kindness and bringing people closer to Yiddish. And I just felt like the, the, the magnitude of our impact in California was a lot less than what I was used to. And it wasn't because anything bad about the people. The people in California were amazing. To this day, I haven't been, we left there 16 years ago. And to this day, we're in touch. Like, the have, people, have you been back? Yes. Yeah, we've been back. We we we've been back to California. Every time we're in like in LA, we drive to Pasadena. We go down. And we go streets. down the same street. Put on the same music. How like, many years were you there for? I'm curious. There for two years. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, it seems like you built some was, fond memories. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it was the beginning of our. You know, marriage. we just got married, married right. and we, yeah, so, it was, it was, so my wife and I do the same thing. We had our, yeah. every time we pass our first apartment that we lived in in the five towns, you, you get in a, we just like, we look over that porch and like, that's where, that's where, first of all, that's where we lived COVID. And that's where our, we brought home our first baby. And like, we try to tell her like, you used to live there. And she's yeah. like, totally, totally Can't not able to understand <laughs> like, well, what? And it, but it's, it's amazing. So I really can relate to what so, you're so saying. So we go back and we put on the same music. Cause you know, music, <laughs> really music, right? Music, what, yeah. what music? I think it was Avram Friedrich. Oh, Moshav. 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 That was right? like a real LA That was like back music. then, LA. Everyone listened to Lord, Moshav. Lord, take me high. That was a little before us, but it was that return again, no? Yeah. Return, return again, again. <laughs> return again. And it fits the the, yeah. the the story. So we put that on. And there was Avram Friedrich. There was a song that my son would would sleep to. Anytime he would cry in the back seat. I put on this music. Yeah. It was oh, Avram Friedrich. This Chazak. one song. What is no, no. no. What, it what was album was it? No, it was Simon like, Israel. Simon Israel, oh my, oh my, yeah. And he, this is, and we we drive to LA to go get our ice cream every month to Shabbos to get like frozen yogurts. And this yeah. is, so we go back. We put this on. Literally, music transforms you, takes you back. So we go there. And we still love it. We 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 we. In our dream is God willing, one day that uh, the shluchim there, Chaim Hanoka, with his with some people from the community, should come visit us because yeah. we love to. You know, they they want. Well, to you do just it. said it on an interview, so now I think he's gonna have to. He's, he doesn't <laughs> have know? a choice. Chaim, we're waiting for you. Yeah. You know, when you look at the camera in the interview and you point the eyes. Yeah. Now so you Chaim, post, if you see this, now we'll clip that, post it on LinkedIn, and there tag you go, him, tag him, and get it. We'll be right back to this episode of the podcast. Pesach is coming up. You know what that means? That means that you need new shirts. Obviously, besides for everything else, and you prepare for for the Seder and Haggadah and everything, and you might want to get like an extra shirt or two because you know that first night you're spilling wine or grape juice all over yourself. So, very simple uh, life hack here: go to collarsandco.com and order yourself some shirts. I'll give you fifteen percent off your purchase right now by using promo code Meaningful. Use promo code Meaningful. You have fifteen percent off any order over a hundred dollars. They are such amazing shirts. They are comfortable. You will feel good. You will look good. You can get short sleeve. You can get the long sleeve. You can get the stuff for work, the multicolor, the white. No matter what community you're part of, Collars & Co. is there for you. And do me a favor. If you go ahead right now and you buy a shirt from CollarsAndCo.com, make sure to send me an email. And we'll put you in a, in a raffle for some meaningful merch. Okay, not just beautiful white shirts, but we'll get you some in a raffle for some meaningful minute merch. Go ahead. Email me at nachi at meaningfulminute.org to enter that raffle. But first, go to CollarsAndCo.com and order some shirts today. So, but then I just felt like we could do more elsewhere. And that's where um, we had a conversation about the possibility of considering going somewhere else. Um, then Kayla, after we had that conversation, left the house. I couldn't find her for a week. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was like, like, like very possible. If, yeah, yeah. You know? No, so she, she was open to uh, considering other options at that point. There was a very sad story about the rabbi in Rostov. The shliach from Rostov was expelled from Russia. Yeah. 
um, which is something that happened. Rostov has a little bit of a history that he was expelled and the shliach before him was put in like house arrest and then by the government by the government but yeah okay. yeah yeah and you're so, like that's perfect so no no no, yeah, so, so no I, right. I, let's I, do I, it so i i didn't i didn't know about this uh that i didn't know that at the time that he was kicked out i mean it made the news because there were some students she had students that were also put into jail American for a night students. yeah that were studying there uh but then rabbi lazar uh we spoke to Moscow, rabbi lazar, yeah. Yeah. yeah he's the uh chief, chief rabbi. rabbi of russia the chief emissary the head shliach um, he told us there's a city in Russia that has um, 15,000 Jews. Would you consider going? And I told Kelly, you know, I, I said, you know, we, 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 we were still on the fence. I wasn't sure. He said, let me just tell you the name of the city. And he says, Rostov, Rostov. And what's Rostov? Rostov for us Lubavitchers is like part of our like history. Well, it's like, like Lakewood, Lakewood for, That's you know, right. uh, uh, um, Gate, uh, Gateshead, is that what it's called in, 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 in London? London? The, yeah, right. It's in, like the England, main, sorry. yeah. That's like the, the, the big. Not so, anymore. Well, didn't Chabad, didn't Chabad Lubavitch like, like reside there? For, yeah, 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 yeah. For a period of time. From 1915, exactly. the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe moved from Lubavitch. The first world war was coming. He moved to Lubavitch. And from Lubavitch to Rostov, and that became the capital. What today, 770, Crown Heights, New York, Brooklyn, uh, not, not Brooklyn, uh, uh, the Queens, the OL, because yeah. he, he passed away in 1920, and he's buried in Rostov. Then the sixth Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, became yeah. Rebbe in Rostov uh, when he passed away, when, when, the, when his father, the fifth Rebbe, passed away. Our Rebbe met the Rebbetson there. He came to visit. In, in, yes, in, 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 in Rostov. Yes. In and Kislova. so at this point, you hear Rostov, there's no rabbi there. Right. There's 15,000 Jews. Right. And it uh, just. But, and Rostov also has a very, very difficult history in terms yeah. of that's where the Nazis killed many, many Jews. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the worst devastation in, in, in Russia proper. It's considered the Babiar of Russia. So Babiar was in Kiev. Yeah. In Russia, the city that was most devastated, the Jewish community that was most devastated by the Nazis was Rostov. So the history is like, it's, there's it's, a lot it, there. It's very, yeah. yeah, the Nazis came into the city in 1942, August 11th um, is the day they put up signs all over town. And they said the Jews must gather at one of six gathering points to be evacuated to safety. They said, we cannot guarantee your safety from the, the, the Russian citizens of the city. That's what they said. And you were to bring your valuables, the keys to your apartments at these six gathering points, 8 a.m. And from there, they were sent to the outskirts of town, a place known as uh, Snakes Valley, Zemiovskaya Balkan, where they were shot dead, 27,000 Jews. So, wow. For, for, for I us, believe I, I've seen you. Uh, is that, there's like a, there's a memorial there. Yes, yeah. yes. There's, there's a like fire. A uh, there's a flame. Yeah, a, a flame. Yeah. Exactly. It's Nigeria for anybody listening to go there. To Absolutely. I, I, I feel, sure. right? That's for us, was one of the things that we felt the, 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 the privilege of going to a city to kind of revive the, the embers, Jewish, the, all the, the sparks that were left from, you know, from the times of the Holocaust and that were, that perished. We have to bring them back. We have to bring back the children and bring back the future. There is, you know, there are so many Jews that are still living there, but they just don't know about their, their history. They don't know about Yiddishkeit. So that's really. Assimilation like rates are job. 95% in Russia. Were so, they globally? I think I think in the states it's in the forties or fifties maybe I, I yeah or maybe it's gone up again we're like fifteen right. we're, we're fifteen years behind on all our stats yeah. <laughs> the, the states you gotta love but, that like you Google stuff it's like from two thousand and twelve it's like it's yeah. like artificial uh, intelligence like I don't know anything for the past four years but five right. years ago right. it was so, so we're a little beyond uh, but take, take me to that conversation of okay Rostov is brought up you're in Pasadena and and you look at each other and there's again there's these things the history there's Lubavitch history is it like yeah, we're in or take a couple days. I'll let you say because um, it felt like a really nice offer, like something that sounded exciting and intriguing because of all that history. But it's still Russia and it's still really, really far. And it's all your family. Right. It yeah. means sacrificing like I knew that means like, you know, be, not being at the Simchas in my family. And it means like having to deal with, chinuch, you know, what, what do we do with our kids? And kosher food, like there were so many different like aspects that we weren't even considering, like when we were in Pasadena. So it was still like a really big, big question, like could we actually, or could I actually do it? I felt like I knew right away that my husband would would be great there, you know, right. like he could be there. But the question was really like, could I do it, and can I raise a family um, so far away um, in Russia? Like that was a really big, really, really big question. Well, how did you get um, your answer, and what was your answer like? So. I wanted to see it for myself. Um, I know there's other shulchan that were like, oh, hey, that sounds great. And they just kind of like moved to the new place and started from scratch. But 
Um, I'm not like that. So I needed to like see exactly. Which makes, which makes sense. Right? Um, I wanted to know like exactly what kind of city it was and, you know, how, how could I live there? So, um, so we also wanted to sweeten the deal a little. So we decided we'll go there to check it out for like three days. And after that, we'll go to Israel on a like a week and a half, two week vacation. <laughs> this way it's a nice, so if, if, if Kayla doesn't like it, at least we went to Israel. We Israel yeah. it. <laughs> right? And that's yeah, how, that's... and I was dying to go to Israel at that point. Like I hadn't been back since seminary. So I was like, yeah, let's do this. Let's do it. So we boarded a flight <laughs> August, 2008 to Moscow. Then we arrived in Rostov. It was a Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. I remember, right? We were supposed to be there Shabbos to check it out. We arrived Thursday, the Russia call, the head of the community, every community in Russia has a rabbi. And that's what's called the Russia call, which is the a president of the community. He's someone that deals with like the government, with you know the secular aspects of the community, more the paperwork. Uh, he's voted in once every five years. So he met us by the airport. And I remember he saw uh, the bags that we had and he saw we didn't have so many bags. He's like, why do you have so few suitcases? And we said, what do you mean? We had two suitcases. We're here till Sunday. And he was like, no, no, you're the new rabbi. I don't know if he was joking or if he was, or if he was. And, and, and I remember I'm like, I'm the new rabbi. Okay, I could live with that. But Kayla was like, what new rabbi? What <laughs> oh, you, what man, you do no, me. This is right. Right, right. This there's is a mistake. A there must have been a little, a little misunderstanding here. And then there's, um, a, there's a community welcoming party for you. Yeah, right? totally. So the funny thing is, what would you think, Nachi? You're, you're, we came off of a, what, 20-hour trip, right? Journey. Yes, we have a baby yeah. with us. What would be... The logical answer, where would you go first from the airport after 20 hours Sleep of Sleep or get some food. One okay. Two. So there's no kosher restaurants there. So let's take out the the, the, the food part. Okay. Sleep is where? Uh, in a bed. Right. <laughs> where would the bed likely be? A house, a hotel. A hotel, exactly. So yeah. we go in the car thinking we're heading to the hotel. We stop. Please don't tell and, me you slept in your car that night. No, no, we did okay, not sleep in the car. Thank yeah. God. Um, the car the car that we went into was a Lada, so you can't sleep in that car. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so we arrive at a building that I thought was a hotel. So I take out the suitcase. He's like, you don't need the suitcases. I'm like, why don't you need the suitcase? He's like, no, we're, we're visiting someone now. So what do you mean? He's like, some people in the community were so excited that the rabbi, the rabbit said, are coming, they want to meet you. I said, really? Now, like, imagine my wife. What time was it? What was the local time? It was like two in the afternoon, I think. Okay. Right. But, but for them, but, but for us, it's like the middle right, of the night. Middle of the night jet yeah. lag. If you want to change, take a shower, put on makeup. Long you know? flight. They yeah. don't care exactly. about that. Imagine, <laughs> they didn't even think. Like, Kayla gets off a flight, 20 hours travel. She didn't have a chance to freshen up. And we're going now to meet, you know, uh, people in the community Some that are influential business. Right. right. <laughs> so I walk into his office, and right away I notice he has a fridge under his table, his desk. I think, why does this guy have a fridge? Right. And about three minutes into the conversation, I found out the hard way. He opens the fridge and pulls out a bottle of vodka. Uh, and it's so welcome to Russia. Exactly. exactly. He, feels, he feels a little shot. <laughs> and he says something like, um, you know, let's make a lechaim for my mother. My mother. I said, okay, that makes sense. You make a lechaim for the mother. So I pick it up and I drink a little lechaim and I put it down. And he looks at me in the eyes and he says, you don't respect my mother. I said, Oh, 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 I get because I didn't drink till the end. You know, it's a protocol. Oh, I could, I'm a big guy, I could handle it. So I, I drank till the end, and he's like, Very good. Before I could put it down, before you heard the cling of putting it down, he's already filling it up a second time. He's now, now for my father, oh, his man. father, Lachaim. Like, I sure, so, his, I sure hope his parents were in divorce in this two more. <laughs> the stepfather, right? So, so I made the second one. Then I was like, That's fair game. You know, we did a day drink for the mother, drink for the father, fair game. We're talking some more, very nice Jew, very nice person. Then he fills it up again. At that point, like Kayla's already getting a little uncomfortable. Like, what's going on, right? Yeah, I think I actually took the vodka off the table, and that was not appreciated. <laughs> you're not allowed. Like, like oh, a woman man. in Russia cannot like m remove the. It's vodka. Like in Italy, you're not allowed to, you know, spaghetti. You're not allowed to crack spaghetti. Oh, oh right, yes, you can't course, crack yeah. spaghetti. I didn't know that. It's not respectful. No, you know, it's, it's like it's, killing it's, the, it's the spaghetti. You can't really? it's like, yes. you're punishable by prison. Light time, right? Wow. Light <laughs> what do you tell you? Crack spaghetti. Yes. yes. <laughs> So the same thing. Yeah. So then he fills another one and he's like, I want to make a lachaim for my uh, oldest son. So I told him. How many kids uh, do you have? Exactly. <laughs> how, how many kids do you have? <laughs> now he knows. And he says, I have uh, four kids. And I'm like, oh, I can't do this four times. So I said, let's make a lachaim for the Gansi Mishpocha, for the whole family. Let's make a lachaim for your kids. And then I was like, you know what? Let's make a lachaim for those that have passed and those that are alive. You shouldn't start now for my grandfather. Made a lachaim. We left his office. And then they took us to another guy's office and the same thing happened. At that oh, point, man. at that point, Kayla's on gone. She's looking at her Palm Pilot, looking at Kayak, looking for tickets to Israel the same day. She's like, Let, let's get out of here. Uh, but what's funny, anyways, we went out of that office. Then How are you, Palm Pilot? Hello there. You remember, right? <laughs> Zyre, 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 Zyre,
Scott, you have all those people listening. Google. Google. I I'm remember gonna, the name. I'm going to speak to your parents now. They shouldn't have given you a palm pilot at that age. At the it, age of seven, it, at the age of seven, you should not have had a palm it pilot. It was like, it had like cave, what is that, that, that game? Right. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, Zyre, Zyre seventy two. That was the that was the that was the way you could write notes and you could play games. And I don't think you can go on kayak on it. But no, 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 no. no, no. She had the first generation, which was a joint Palm Pilot and phone. Uh, So phone was called the right. Anyway, so it's after my time. Yeah, that's (laughs) exactly. So then we went into second. We came out of the second office. We're like going to the hotel. He's like, no, there's one more guy we have to go to. We have to stop by. Please, if we don't stop, he's gonna get insulted. What can I do? When in Russia, right? So yeah. well, we went along, we came to the guy's office and this guy, Baruch Hashem, had no, f- under his table, he had no fridge. And we're like, Baruch Hashem, Hashem, listen to our prayers. My wife is calming down. In the middle of the conversation, I asked him, what do you do for, what's your business? He says, let me show you. And he opens the back door to his office and what opens up, there's a vodka warehouse. This oh guy's producing gosh. the vodka that the other guys are serving us. His name is Lev. He's a Kafkazia Sephardic Jew. And that's what he does. And he's like, come, now we try. What does he do? And he needs vodka, he doesn't need a fridge. He just tears one of the pallets and pulls out a bottle. Anyway, it was a very, very uh, hard landing, right? No? Yes. Definitely a nice welcome to Russia. Right. We knew where we came they to. Went what to were, they went to like test your, your to weight. Test, exactly. Your, you know? Absolutely. We're testing you. That, 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 but that was the test. Honestly, like, to this test. day, the way you connect uh, on, on, with, with, with someone in Russia, you connect through camaraderie, through friendship. And how's that done by a table? Yeah, I remember, with a little high, and filter I'm, fish. I remember Shlani Zions went to Rasta. We did some, we did a video. You in did. And I think he called me. He's like, dude, I, I never drank that much in my life. I don't know what's going on <laughs> here. Way, I remember. He yeah, was, was so. <laughs> we had a couple got engaged the day he was there. And I was debating what should I do. Shlaimi came for one day to film. And I have the, this boy and girl that, that actually she'll tell a story about this girl. Amazing story. And, and we're like, what should we do? And like, you know what? We'll make, we'll make a big simcha together. Shlaimi's like, are you okay? I asked him, are you okay coming to the Lachaim? He's like, yeah, of course. He didn't know what he was getting himself into. And then my, then the, the guys were filling up for him, filling up for him. Everyone wanted to make a Lachaim with a guest from America. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, shop that night we went to the hotel. We got there in the afternoon, fell asleep, woke up. I woke up like before Shabbos. I was out. You can imagine it was a whole day of, you're jet lagged, you're tired, and l'chaim. Um, but but Friday night we came to our shul. It's a beautiful 100, now it's 151 year old shul, a Cantonese shul. And I don't know if your uh, listeners know who the Cantonists. Do you know who the Cantonists were? No. You, no. So the Cantonists, this is one of the saddest stories of Russian Jewry that after many, you know, the, the, the I, I guess you could say there were many different ways that non-Jews tried to assimilate the Jews. Most of the history, the Jewish history was always through violence, through hardships, through pogroms, through uh, difficult. But at some point there was a czar, if I'm not saying it was czar Nikolai I that came out with a new idea. He said, why don't we take these kids when they're a young age and re-educate them in a non-Jewish environment. And then they're gonna serve 25 years in my army. And at that point they're gonna be assimilated. They're gonna leave the Jewish faith and they'll become uh, true Christians. And that's what he did. He he, he uh, made a law that Jewish children, they would come to a shtetl, like you'd have co- generals, commanders coming to a shtetl. They tell the rabbi tomorrow, we're there gonna be- be a quota. Right, so what? Like they'd So come- they would say, however many children should be on this list. And the rabbi had to come up with, you know, that, that amount of children that they would gather and then send on this very long journey to wherever the military, like educational army bases center, were, right? Yeah, um, and you know, it, it was. I mean, just imagine, like, if we were the rabbi at the time, and like coming up how with this decide? list. Yeah, how do you decide this, who this, gets on, who gets off? I'm sure there was like something with money that it's people like the that had. Games, you know? yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What was going on here? No, it's 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 it was a horrific predicament for the rabbi to be in for the community. Imagine, because these kids are leaving forever. So um, can I just say there were also people called choppers. These were Jews whose job were, was to actually take kids from the street, take Jewish kids from the st- street who were like just walking to Cheder and like hop them, just grab them oh and gosh. send them off to to be part of this. They quota. did this why instead of instead of like why, why why would they do this? What was their what was in, what was their incentive? Like they did it in, instead of their own kids. It was or th- that was just they were representing. I guess maybe like you know like in the in the Holocaust there was like Gestapo's. Yeah, the, right. Jews, the, 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 the Jews that were they were treated better. Right, right. They got better treatment. Yeah, no, I heard I heard the hoppers. I heard the hoppers. It was right. but but the crazy. So imagine the rabbi is sitting at night in his house. He calls a meeting 
with the heads of the households, the the the, the fathers of the, of, of the of the shtetl, and the proper rabbis. What they did is they made a, a lottery, a raffle, and they put the names of every single family, and they would choose out of there thirty names if that was the quota that they had to give. And those families found out that this is their last night with their child. Terrible. And the crazy thing was sometimes the rabbis' own children they're in the raffle as well. They'd come out and imagine the rabbits and hears that her son was came out of the raffle and now they have to give him they have to lottery they have, they have to give him up the next day so it's a horrific and they're giving their kids up to the military so so the next day the the generals would come they'd pick up 30 kids they'd take them to army bases that are thousands of miles away so you're never going to see them again there's no the journey was actually horrific like i was reading about it and um a lot of kids didn't even survive they were given like huge boots to be to wear and like different you know army clothes to wear that were like so big on him some of these kids were like six years old like really tiny kids um, and they weren't given food. And just along the way, like I was reading like that there were hundreds of, of kids who were just dying on the way and to nobody even knew base. about right. where they were. Right. No one and, had anyone. And they'd never hear from them again. Yeah. That's it. So when they got to the base, they were re-educated. That means they were put through uh, a non-Jewish school system that the, the, the goal of this school system was to get them out of Yiddishkeit, out of Judaism, and to identify as non-Jews. And so they, they do this for until they're 18. Once they hit the age of 18, then they began a 25 year mandatory service in the Tsar's army. So you can imagine, we're talking here about 35 years, 33 years. Take a seven year old and- That's yeah. it, and, and, and that's it. So, but what's, what's amazing about, there's a lot of stories about them. I don't know if we'll have time to share these stories, but what's amazing is that when they, these, there's so many stories of, of, of Jewish, resilience that these soldiers had that despite they forgot their traditions they forgot how to read they didn't have any connection with anything but they were so proud of their jewish heritage they were proud jews there's stories of how much they sacrificed us to remain jewish uh, even when 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 the, when 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 the, they were punished punished by death they they stayed remained faithful many of them so when they came back to rostov so at the age of 43, they finished their mandatory service. They came back to Rostov. They went into, Rostov had 15 shuls. They went into one of the shuls. They wanted to come back to their roots. But imagine you have a guy coming in, he's not married, he has no kids. He's scarred from 25 years of army service. A lot they of them acted really weird, you know? They were probably psychologically like harmed after right. all these yeah. years, they yeah. were beaten all the time. Were they trying to like reach out to their families or they don't even know where to start? They're taking I, such I, for, a long time ago. I, I think, Maybe you know, they didn't even come back to their own They, they did not come back to their homes because you have to realize in those years, you're gone for 30 years, there are pogroms. These little shtetls and villages you have don't gone think through. You there's even anybody, who, yeah. They, 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 and also the age difference, you have to realize, imagine your parents were people, the, 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 the average lifespan parents back 40, then. you were seven. 40, exactly. Right. You put 30 years, who's living past 70? Do you, do you know of any like, like, United stories, like where parent were, were kids who were there, were not united with their I parents. I, I, I don't. Well, there's a song, a very famous song called Schleimele. Yeah. It was like a camp song, right? Where this little boy was three years old. He had a scar on his hand. Um, and then he was taken to the army and he was serving the army for years and years. And he forgot his, he was Jewish. And then he came back kind of like as a, you know, to, to like, you know, to his father's house to kind of get his father in trouble for learning. And then his father, when he picked up his arm, his father recognized that scar and said, Shlaimala, you're my son. And they returned after that. That's, that's probably like, based literally every at Camp Cantata. Like that, right. that yeah. I'm yeah. serious. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. I know, we but always it's based say that on that guy's true, from- They be, they be yeah. Rottenberg uh, era of uh, yeah. songs. That yeah. I, I, by the way, I miss them. I miss those songs right nowadays. All the songs are just- Iron, about no, the this, Iron Curtain. Yeah, I miss, I miss the, the, the songs. Ellie Schwabel has a beautiful song yeah. about that as well. About, about brothers who were separated, one behind the yeah. Iron Curtain. Right, the right, right. Yeah. Time, I, I get so emotional. I, I Like when we do our camp in the summer and it's a six hour, no, it's a yeah, seven hour drive from our city. When I drive, I just listen to these songs. It just connects you to the it's moment. like Dear Nicol Nicola? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That and Benny just, re, Benny just redid it. Re did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they're, they're, they're very, but, but what's amazing, they came back, they went to shul and in the shul, the regular shul, they said, we're not going to call you to the Torah because you're, who you know who you are. Yeah, exactly. You're outcast. You're you're off. You're so at some point they said, you know what? We must build our own shul. And they gathered the funds. I don't know how they got it. And they built the shul that's known as the Cantonese shul, the soldier's shul. To this day, it's called wow. officially the soldier's shul. And what's interesting is that from the 15 shuls of Rostov, the only shul that survived 
the pogroms, the Nazis, communism is this shul. There's a bigger shul that today's a hospital. Another one was bombed. Another one was destroyed. This is the shul that we use to this day. So this is the shul we came to Friday night to daven in. And it's a beautiful is, shul. Is this the shul things. that you This is our, this is our shul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is that our is, shul. That is so amazing. And, and, That's and so it's like meaningful. such a lesson for everybody, right? That like, we could look at somebody and judge them that, you know, they look scary or they're outcasts or whatever it is. But like to Hashem, like they're the most precious. The simple yeah. the story. It's of also the, simple... the things, the things that are done out of the immense pain that you go through. Like if you're able to take right. the most broken shards in your life, you could build, rebuild the most beautiful vessel. And that'll, that'll like. I'll I'll do last anything. The of time. It's so yeah. funny. It reminds me of a story. My mother doesn't know this, and that's the first time I'm saying this. I was by. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Oh my gosh, <laughs> mom! Oh my turn gosh. off. I turn off the. Uh, she listens to the this podcast. podcast every Monday. She <laughs> my father, and I get a, I get a whole rundown. So she's. Good. They, oh they, they review them. They review. Them? I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to say it because it's been so long. And I, every if time, this is a tell all, we're going to have to do some tell all. Oh, this is a scoop. We should put this on behind like a Patreon paywall. <laughs> Uh, so I was in their house for Shabbos not too long ago. I was with my daughter or whatever. Somehow there's a vase <laughs> in the living room of my parents' house and it broke, right? Just just broke. And we're like, oh, no. My parents were away. <laughs> Mommy's going to go. And we were just as me. Mommy's going to go. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, oh, man. I don't like we looked on. I looked on like different websites to reorder this thing like out of stock. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So it was my job to go back Sunday after Shabbos and go back and just, you know, get rid of this vase. Right now, she's listening to this. She is looking <laughs> rich. Where is the vase? So, like, what happens? I get there. I get there to the house, and and I, uh, I'm, I in front of me are like it's probably eight, ten pieces of glass. There's a tall vase, like tall. And um, I was getting ready to throw it out. I'm like, maybe I could try to like glue back together. <laughs> so I, I go. I look in some drawers there, and um, my parents live there. You know, they're living there for. 30 almost 30 years so every house 30 years you got some Juncture, gorilla glue yeah. somewhere so i found some gorilla glue and i start piece by piece and like by the way you know about me i'm not a handy guy i'm not like a shit like that i'm yeah. like that i have two tire, left hands tire goes yes. flat i'm like calling You're calling 911 911 what do we yeah. <laughs> so i start gluing piece by piece piece by piece i was so focused piece by piece and then i put it back and i sent the picture to my my bro- my brother and my sister and i said there it is they're like you got a new one i'm like no, I put it back together. And every time I'm in my parents' house, I look at that thing and I'm like, that's like my, I'm so proud of wow. that thing that was broken and it was meant, for, it was discarded. As you're saying this story, your mom is picking up this vase mm. and she's, she is I, she's, like, she's, she's <laughs> now looking from every possible Literally, direction by the way, she's and like, the imperfection suddenly she's noticing. The thing, if when I go back there, I'm the only one that could see right. those cracks. And I get enough from saying, ah, oh, those used to be cracks, but now it's glued together. And those people, wow. those Cantonists, that's, that's they were their broken story. pieces, yes, and they put back together. And fifty, and it's more that's the shul that that is standing that, today. That, that, All the other shuls, that shul is standing. We'll be right back to this episode in just a second, but first, a word for my friends at Tata Town Appliance, guys. They are celebrating forty-five years in business. How many of you have been alive for forty-five years? Let alone running a thriving business for forty-five years for no other reason. That's why you should be working with Town Appliance. They've been doing it for quite a while. They're good stuff. They know how to work with the firm community. They know exactly what your needs are. They know exactly the knitches of you need delivered then and you need this and you need to have this Shabbos mode, that Shabbos mode. You don't need to be speaking to some appliance company trying to explain to them. No, no, no. So this year is a three day Yantif and, and on Tuesday I need it to stay on. And they'll be like, uh, ma'am, what is our Yantif? No, deal with town appliance. They will take care of you. And they've been around since 1979. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly the service our community. So you get to townappliance.com. They're always having sales. There's always having good things, things at great prices. So at the townappliance.com, or you can just send them a message on WhatsApp. Hit the link in the description and the show notes of this episode. Shoot them a message on WhatsApp at Town Appliance. Whether you're doing a new construction, you want to pl- replace some old appliances in your house, Town Appliance is the place to go. Now back to this episode. And you know what's, ama- what's amazing about them? What... Guess what was their most enjoyable Jewish holiday? What would you say? Some chastara. Ah, so you know, <laughs> no, you know, I guessed. Know. Really? I mean, it's only so, one, it's one out of seven. Like, yes. tell me. <laughs> okay, very impressive, but I'm a little suspicious. Just, but, well, well, I don't know. Which other? Okay, so listen to this. Hanukkah. Why some chastara? Why? Let's. Uh, you okay. could drink. You could drink. <laughs> yeah. they, they were very Russia, good at drinking, right? by the way. Right? They were good at drinking, but um, the reason was 
the whole concept of Simchas Torah, why do we not, we're not, and Simchas Torah is not about learning Torah, it's about dancing with the Torah. Yeah. And they couldn't learn the Torah. They could barely read it. Um, you hear stories of how they davened, like they'd come in for Yom Kippur and they'd bang on the on the bima and they'd say, today is the day of repentance. Everyone repent and people would yell and cry and that's what they knew how to do. That was a true. But Simchas Torah, they'd take the Torahs out of the ark and they take off their sh- the seventh hakafa, the most famous hakafa. And I'd like to say that we still do it today, but we don't fully do it. They took off their shirts, their shirts. They'd call the children over and they'd point to the children and they'd say, you see these scars? These are the scars that we had and we had to, 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 to live through. And, none, and despite that, we remained proud Jews. And they'd hug the Torah scrolls to their bare chests and they'd dance for hours. And they said, look, Hashem, we lived through the hardest of times. We fought in the hardest of wars. This scar here was when they wanted to kill us for being here. This scar here was when they told us to convert. This scar here, but we remained faithful. And we love you, Hashem. We love our heritage and our tradition. They'd hug the Torah for hours. They'd dance the seventh akafa. So for us, Simchas Torah always, like we get to the seventh akafa, we, sh- we we get the chills. We don't take off our shirts and we don't dance nearly as much as they dance, but it's just like, um, so so we're in this shul Friday night and we're looking at the Jews, the, the, the beautiful Jews of Rastav, and we're just like going back in time and just thinking who are the Jews that built the shul and what they lived through and the hardships they had to, they had to survive through. And it just it was a very special Friday. And Friday night, we sat there. After this is when the, you're visiting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're we're visiting back. there, right? We're going back. We're jumping around here. So this episode is going to need a little bit of uh, yeah, no, notebook. And, and, it, it's a custom to the human brain. We all jump around. Yes, yes. Uh, so what happened was Friday night, we finished davening. We went to do Kiddush, then they brought out the challah, I did challah, and then I said, okay, bring out the food, and they said, uh, we don't uh, do the, the." We, I said, where's the meal? They said, we don't have a meal. I said, what do you mean? You don't? They said, no, we, uh, we, we don't, and then I understood they couldn't afford to put on a full mm-hmm. meal, so they just did the- This is when you're visiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like best foot forward for the almost rabbi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like- and and, and what's, what's, what's amazing, so I, I figured, okay, if there's no shalom, there's no kishka, there's no schnitzel, no meat board, People are going to head home. But that's when I learned that the Jews of Russia come to Shul, not for the Cholent and the, the Kishke, yes, not yeah. for the God. They come to Shul to connect to Hashem. They come to Shul to connect with their heritage. They come to Shul because they're proud of who their ancestors were and they're proud of the memories they have. And they sat that night around the table for what? How many hours? It was, they were just sitting asking questions. They were just, a rabbi's in town, a rabbi's in town. We want to, you know, and I was just in my element, no? I was like... I couldn't really speak at that. Right, so Kayla didn't speak Russian. That was, what was your... I mean, I guess at that point, you're seeing your husband, that spark is back. Yeah. Did you sure. see the spark? Was it back? Absolutely, 100%. He came there and he was like like a fish in water. He was like in his element. Um, for me, I was more like an observer. I didn't, re- I didn't understand anything that was going on. People were trying to communicate, but like they don't get that like if you talk solely in Russian, that's not going to help <laughs> yeah. you, you know? <laughs> Um, so I really was clueless, um, and nobody there really speaks English. Um, so, but you, sp- you spoke, uh, Chaim, you spoke. Yeah. I, sp- I spoke Ru- cause, because of, so I'm not Russian. Because of camp. Like, because of the camps, I spoke some Russian, so I was, I was fine. Not fluent, it. but. I was good enough. He was no, very was good. Fine. So yeah. you would speak to them in Russian yeah, also? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, I spoke in Russian. Um, yeah, It's like yeah, a match yeah. made in heaven, like you speak right. Russian. Right. All you really needed is for your wife to be on board. Right. right. Which is, you make it sound like all oh, you need, like, just know it. <laughs> it's a pretty big deal it for, is. for most of mankind, most of, uh, uh, you know, from Jews in America. But I, I just felt like, like, this is our shalichas. This is, so we were there for a few hours. And I just remember that night I couldn't fall asleep. I went back to the hotel. Now, I couldn't fall asleep also because um, there were mosquitoes in the room and the AC mm-hmm. was dripping on my bed and a few other reasons. <laughs> you know, the hotel yeah, wasn't a five star yeah, hotel. It wasn't Waldorf. No, it wasn't yeah. Waldorf. <laughs> And it wasn't the Ritz, um, but no, I, I was really like just just trying to to digest what I just felt and saw, and I'm just my mind is like just working through the night, just thinking, wow, this is like exactly what I was wait for two years. I was lacking this, and suddenly I'm experiencing it again, and the same thirst that I remembered my campers having and the Jews that we dealt with are still exists. And we woke up in the morning, we did a Shabbos. Is there any other memories from Shabbos? It was, I think Kayla was fasting most of it, right? <laughs> Probably. I still have not gotten used to the Russian food. Oh, really? I don't think I ever will. Uber Eats, won't, I, uh, Uber Eats won't travel. No, <laughs> did, I, did I embrace it? Yeah. 
I, 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 I got into the whole thing. I mean, I still don't eat orange vegetables, so I can't right. have like the like, simmus. It's so the, funny. Like Russian cuisine is sort of like soup. Like, like lots they're of very soups. into their soups. Yeah. 100%. Lots of mayonnaise, right? Yes, they love their mayonnaise. Far farina? Yeah. What? Farina? Farina? No, no farina? not really. That's that? like that like white oatmeal, kasha. Like, no, they're no, into no, like no. the real black, like yeah, buckwheat yeah. kasha. Yeah. That's I think there's a new restaurant in New York that is George, George, George. Oh, yeah. Marani? Something like that. Oh, I heard it's really interesting. It's great. I love but, like, it. It's great. But you it's guys great. have that food? We know. We know that food already. So, like so, there's some things that for sure I like from yeah, there. She got but used that's to not some like the... real authentic Russian food. Like what the, is Russian food? Like we know like, like Mexican food is tacos right. and American so, like, is burgers. What is Russian like, food? Like rib of clare or like. It's like different. A lot of fish. Um, um, the podshuba. What, what's the Yeah, that's like there? a mix of. Um, it's rib, uh, No, it's not like podshuba. What is it? Riba podshuba. It's riba podshuba. Yeah. yeah. It's Dude. sardines on the bottom. Oh, or something sounds rough. I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a big. With like sardines. layers of layers. like mayonnaise and with like coleslaw and mayonnaise with carrots maybe. It's really like. It's a beautiful? pretty, a pretty dish. It looks beautiful. It tastes great for people that like that, but right. we just don't like that one so much. <laughs> but we do like other stuff. No, the, the, the truth is, fish. yeah, yeah. But we, we, we got used to the yeah. plov is Wait, not so you, Russian. You, you, but you guys made a decision to accept. So we we left there. We went to Israel. Came back to California, and we discussed it right a little bit. I I could say a little bit about how Please. I still wasn't sure of like okay. this whole idea, and I was like, you know what, Hashem, you have to give me a sign that like. I know that my husband fits into this place, but like, where do I fit in? Um, and I remember we were walking towards like the OL of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. Um, and on the way, we're like reading all the graves. This is in Rostov. The, the Rebbe is in Rostov the fifth, when right. we were yeah. there, when we were visiting there. Yeah. yeah. And we're reading all the tombstones and like. It's an old Jewish cemetery. There, yeah, 100 years old. Or yeah, more. more. Yeah. Um, and just because it's so interesting, this whole cemetery, it's like such a fascinating cemetery. Um, and some of them are written in Hebrew and some in Russian. So we're breaking our teeth over the Russian, trying to read them. And then one like really close to the Rebbe said Estrin, which is my last name. And I was it's like, your maiden name, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my maiden name. Well, so, well, in what context did it say that? Like that's one that of was, the people that passed there. away there. Were they someone... related to you? Maybe. We still don't know. I mean, it's not a common It's not, it's a, not a very name. common name. No. I never bump into Estrin. So to see but that also there. also Estrin historically is not a, not a Chabad not a Rush, family. No. no. Or it Russian. It probably comes from Esther. Like, you know how there's like Rifka is Rifkin. Right. Or right. Rifkin comes from Rifka. Right. And like, you know, Chaikin comes from Is that what Gur Chaya. Estrin comes from or no? Probably. Like, we don't know for a fact, but it seemed like You're it. telling me you didn't like investigate further? No, I didn't. But Maybe. you saw that and that was I saw was that and sign. I was like, okay, I think Hashem was saying that like I belong here. That Estrin like belongs one, in Rostov. Right. And then also um, my father wrote this comic book called Mendy and the Golem. Um, Big shout very, out, by the way, yeah. for anyone. Now this is, um, this this is, is a long 80, time ago in the, the 80s. This is in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Any from Jew in America pretty much heard, was it a Chabad thing or was it outside of Chabad? It was Chabad, actually. But it, it was, was just endorsed Chabad by Chabad. Was, no, it was, it was for everybody. Okay. So but like it's a the comic Rebbe book. Kind of... Imagine back when the Batman, the Superman comic books, or whatever they're called. What, what, it was what, the what? first Jewish Marvel? comic book. Yeah, yeah. Marvel. So this was yeah. the Jewish Marvel. Really? And anyone you tell, like when I, when I tell people uh, I'm married to uh, the author of Mendy and the Golem, his uh, daughter, right? The daughter, my wife is the daughter of the author. Like that, that's my yichus. That's so funny. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't so have Gezh. We're like, not Gezh, but we have this. But what's so crazy is your your sister married... It was involved with Tavito. Tavito, right. And Tavito is the modern day Mendy and the Golem. Yeah. A little, a little shout out, my friends, to Tavito. It's a wonderful <laughs> Tavito. online, <laughs> use, pro online yeah. uh, use promo code MM10 for 10% off. Oh, right? And 10% yeah. will go to Rostov. Yes. Chaim and Achama, please don't forget about that. Yeah. <laughs> behind me, my, my daughter was watching uh, Tavito. She loves it. So. Yeah. It but it's so funny. Good. It's all in your family. Yeah. yeah. Mendy yeah, and the Golem and then Tavito. Tavito right. That's and what really else? Cool. And our bar mitzvah videos. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoy making like uh, entertaining bar mitzvah videos so uh, we that's, done that that's cool yeah so, so what happened so you so, you, so you saw I walked that into and... I saw oh, that Mendy the Golem just sitting on like on the table in the shul and Where? I was like wow in, in Chesed in you're the basement you're kidding me <laughs> wait so in Rostov I didn't even know you that. saw Mendy the Golem yes. sitting there like, just that's sitting my there. father's yes and like what could it be doing there? No, I, mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't tell Kayla I brought it with me. I planted that. <laughs> you didn't really I did. You and, did. I, and also the Estrin name, the Estrin name, I, like in the middle of the night, I was, I was carving out so Estrin. So the police are looking at you, you defaced it. <laughs> 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 Not joking, I did it. But it's possible that there was a yeshiva there with all these American kids. So it could have been that they had brought it there because like nobody in Russia has ever heard but about it. still, you're there for one Shabbos. Right, and, boom, it's, and there. it's just crazy that I saw that. So Wow. So right away you're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I got two signs. Like, wow. I think Hashem is showing me something. 
Right. Get, get back to Pasadena. You have this conversation. And what happened? Uh, so we came back and and um, I popped the question. You popped the question. And will I you said, move yeah. to Rostov with me? Right. Yes. <laughs> I said yes. I will. Wow. We sold everything we had there. We did a, a Craig's. <laughs> Craigslist. 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 Yes. <laughs> yes. And it was crazy, right? We it had was. people coming Fine in. Had, was a way that I we flew can... to. I, I wanted to. So now that we're going, the first thing I wanted to do, I want to fly to the OHEL to write into the OHEL to the Rebbe and to ask for a blessing that this should be the right move for us, for our family, for the community, that should be successful. The history of the city, as I said, was a difficult one before with the previous rabbis being expelled. So while I went there, I didn't have uh, phone coverage for five hours. By the time I landed, I had like eight missed calls because <laughs> there were like a hundred people in our apartment buying everything that we owned and everything that the landlords owned. They were just like walking out with like, you know, we were selling like a mattress. They were taking the springboards with it, right? They and they were, were like, where are our helpers? They wanted like me or my yeah. husband to like come and like slap it with them. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll help you. Kayla's also not the best bargainer. So like, like we wanted to sell for like 50 bucks and like took it for like 12. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And like one lady brought me all quarters. She's like, it's okay. That is all quarters. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we, so these are typically getting like garage sale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, 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 we sold everything and we had, I think, a few suitcases left. So we shoved them in a car and we drove cross, cross country to uh, Pittsburgh because we, Kayla was expecting our second child. And we figured best, let's give birth here and then we'll move. Huh? So we did that. Kayla had a baby. And believe it or not, today we're having this interview 15 years to the day no way. that we moved out in 2009. February 18th? What is February it? 17th, we took okay. off. February 18th, we landed there. Wow. So today is the day we landed in Russia 15 yeah. years this ago. This wasn't planned. No, no it was not planned. Everything this, was this, planned for this is, wow. I just thought of this as I was coming here, and I was thinking, how funny is it that we're coming to the podcast on the day, 15 years to the day that we moved out on uh, this really you know, amazing shlachas for us. That's been yeah, a journey. That's been like 15 years. So much has happened. So much we've seen and experienced. And we've been inspired by the Jews there. That it's just like, who would believe like 15 years ago when we went out, we'd have no idea what, what, what would be coming yeah. our way. So, um, so she gave birth. We, uh, got him a, we, he's like, how old was he when we went to the concert? We had to get him a passport. Right after his birth. As soon Imagine, as his birth yes. Nine over, days old, boom. Yeah. Nine days old, we drove Put in a car. Apartment. Remember this? We're driving in a car. It's cold winter in Pennsylvania. We had to drive to Philadelphia five hours. How long is it? Because there's no passport center. Okay. In, uh, we had to get it fast because then we had to get a visa. We did it all very fast. And then we took off to uh, Rostov. We landed there. And the journey has been a most exciting adventurous what else can we say we'll what put up it? the picture of you uh, i think i saw it on linkedin i think even today that you your wife and your and your when we and our, and our, our two our two kids and we had two, two sons, and, two sons. And, yeah. and with all your luggage two else yeah. suitcases you are. 10 of which were uh were uh what were the 10 of them were i think um food right. <laughs> and, uh, to get us back actually i, I think forgot food. to say who, who was with us on the plane Right. Oh, <laughs> who was with you? I had this, this was lady, crazy. Like this a, is like a Russian babushka. She was like from like Brighton Beach, and the entire time she kept saying, "Why are you going to Russia? Why?" And I was like, "Well, we need to help the Jewish community. We have to give them all the Yiddish guy and everything." And she Wait, was you like, were still on the fence then, right? Yeah, you were still, still yeah, like, let, let's be honest. I'm coming. Kayla's yes, flying there, but she's still. It was there's still worried. undercurrents, right? Definitely. And she was like, "Why do you have to do such a horrible thing to your children? Look at these beautiful." Precious children, you want to subject them to this? I literally, I felt like like she was like my Sahara, like talking to me, like, You're like well, there's a sign. <laughs> right? um, but then, like the more, yeah, I was but she was coming. Her, she was coming to pick up her grandchildren yeah. from Rostov to move them to America, and we're moving there. And she's it's sort just, of like a firefighter. Yes, you know, it's right. like people yes. are running out of a building, and they're running into the building. Hundred percent. And what did you say? You felt that what? And like the longer I spoke to her, I literally had to like convince her why it's so important. And so like I kept telling her that like the Jewish people need us. There's nobody else. And like I was just going on and on. And then like I started convincing myself that like actually I need to do this. So, so it um, I felt like she helped and you, me and you, in my you, journey. You were believing what you were saying. Uh, yes, as I was saying, it, I'm like it's so true what I'm saying. Actually, it's amazing um, how Shem puts every listen. single it's person and in, in, in interaction in you know. I I went to the city a few uh, right after October seventh. I went to Manhattan. I set up shop in Times Square with a table that says, "How does it feel to be Jewish right now?" Yeah, um, I saw that. Very hostile time. We brought security. You know, like we mm -hmm. sat down. There were film crew, and I'm 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 very shy by nature. So you I'm are? not the type. Yeah, I'm not the type to run mm -hmm. over to people and start like chatting them up. And, hey, do you want to talk? 
So I'm like there and like, you know, hopefully my brother was going to go get some people to come talk to us. And we set up shop right in this place. And there's this woman sitting there and I sit down and she comes and takes a picture of the sign. And uh, she says, thank you for this. First, like mamish lady sitting right there. I said, well, where are you from? She's like, I'm uh, from a state road. Wow. I was there. I was there. In October. Wow. Uh, she's like, I was there on October 7th. Wow. This is when? How many? Uh, uh, what? A this short is, while after? This is, yeah. This is probably less than a month, a month wow. after. She came to New. She came to wow. get away a little bit. Um, but it's like this woman sitting there in it Times was done, Square. It was done for the, everything you did. Just was chilling. Just, yeah. Me, this whole thing orchestrated was in 18 hours before. Like, are we going to do it? Are we not going to do it? The Let's timing it. that we got there, the place that we sat down, and this wow. woman sitting there. And it's just like, oh my gosh. If you don't believe in God... You need to like look should into go, your lives. I feel I should go off track here about this to to realize. Dude, we're, we're always off track. Real, it's okay, track. okay, because okay. because there's two things I want to share, but I'm first going to share this. You know, if you're talking about the right place at the right time, I'm a huge believer that every single one of us, every Jew today, has a shluchas. Every single Jew has a mission, God given mission that only you could fulfill. Meaning. There's no one else. If you don't come through and do what you're meant to do, no one else in planet Earth could fulfill your shlucha. So I felt this very strongly. Remember when, when we went to the winter camp? Yeah. Crazy story. So every summer we do a summer camp yeah. and we gather children. It's our, it, that's our passion because we both started in, 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 in Russia and Ukraine with camps. So to this day, that's our most exciting project that just gives us so much fulfillment knowing that we're saving we're sending cars to little villages towns picking up children jewish kids it's their one chance to have to be exposed to yiddishkeit to judaism yeah, so to we have do a this, shabbos right to, to learn they they like from there we could send them off to yeshivas to seminaries to, to Eretz Yisrael. some of them today are are an idf it's like i'm so long story short the last day of camp is always such a heartbreaker. Why? Because yeah. they're going back to towns that have no shalom no rabbis no shuls no they're not going to see another jew for a full year so I always feel bad. So for the past 10 years or 12 years, I, I, I've been repeating a lie every single year. Well, what happens is I go to speak at the banquet. I say the last words, wishing them this, that. And then I tell them, I see how sad they are. I said, we have good news. They're we literally did. sobbing like yeah. the last night. Well, they're in like, camps, camps here, you also saw, but there's different, different reasons. Yeah, right. yeah. It's like, because they know true. they're going back to a life that has very little Jewish content and, and they just connected with it. Their neshama is connected. So I tell them every year, we're going to make a winter camp this year because I really want to do it. And I and always, every year, cheering and, and everyone's excited. cheering and they calm down. Wow. We don't have to wait 12 months. We're going to wait only five months, four months. We could handle it. And every year I want to do it. But when it comes closer to the winter and you know, we're, we have a soup kitchen and a meals on wheels and a special needs organization and the school. And it just doesn't, it just financially, it doesn't happen. But now with what's going on in the war, yeah. um, Kayla said a year, this like, so Kayla said, we got to do it this year. We have to do it. You know, it's a very difficult time for everyone here. We're all feeling the pressures of what's going on. Let's make this winter camp happen. They need it this year. So I said, you know what, if we're doing it, let's do it right. Let's find it. Rostov is in Southern Russia. There's not a lot of snow. So I said, let's find a place that has a lot of snow. We can, you know, winter wonderland ski or, or sk skate something. So they found the closest place that had a lot of snow was 10 hour drive. It's a place called uh, Karachay Cherkevsk. It's a far off, it's a Muslim Republic, but they have a lot of snow. I found the campsite there that we could rent. Everything's amazing. And we went off with 150 kids, 130 kids. We arrived there and I saw the shock of my life. There's no snow. <laughs> we went, we paid double the price. We traveled 10 hours and there's no snow. So you see on the top, the, the, the mountains, mountains you see snow, snow but enough. I thought we're going to have everywhere. We're going to sled or we're going to slide. Anyway, there's no snow, but I, you know, I calmed down. Everything's going to be fine. It's such a practice. We're meant to be here on Shabbos. The craziest thing happened. Hey, you're wondering why the episode just stopped abruptly in the middle of the conversation. <laughs> Funny story. Just in the video of this podcast. Um, I don't know how to break it this to you, but. Nah, he made a little bit of mistake with one of the cameras. So you're gonna have to listen to the rest of this podcast. Luckily, there's another like hour of content from this episode. It is that good. So just head to Apple or Spotify or the Meaningful Minute app and listen to it there. That's 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 a great option. Listen to it there um, for the rest of this episode. Maybe you're in your car, you're sitting around your couch with your family. Um, might not be as convenient, but it'll be just as fun because the content is awesome. Head to Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, the Meaningful Minute app and listen to the rest of the episode there. Once you're there, maybe leave a rating or review. It helps us out a ton. It helps more people find our podcast. Thank you so much for listening to the pod. The Rostov Rabbi, the Rebetzin are such incredible people. Like I'm telling you, I was speaking to them for hours, hours. 
and you can hear the rest of it on audio. Enjoy. <laughs> 